Thank you for that video, Rick. That was nice. Uh, the scripture today is 2 Peter 1, 12 through 21. <clears throat> so I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. For we did not follow ever cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were our witnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when, he, when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. As we ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him in the sac on the sacred mountain, we also have that prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it. As to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretations of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to God. God. Well, I hope you don't mind. Ooh, that sounds a little hot. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. Uh, we're going to do Advent a little different this year. I know you're used to the regular kind of scripture passage we normally use, and we'll have a lot of those in the Christmas Eve service. But I want to continue going through the one-year Bible. So I'm picking passages that we're reading, and we're going to still have the themes. Uh, we're going to do them in a little bit different order this year as I looked ahead to the scriptures. So normally you do hope, and then peace, and then joy, and then love. Uh, but this year we're going to do hope, and then love, and then peace, and then wind up with joy, okay? So I hope that doesn't throw anybody off or ruin your Christmas or your Advent season, all right? Okay, but I'm looking forward to preaching this word to you today about searching for certainty. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being our foundation, being our rock, our fortress, our very present help in any time of trouble the one we can turn to no matter what, and the one who's always there for us, the one who never leaves us or forsakes us. And so, Father, thank you for that great truth as we, as we in this world see so things that are so uncertain and we search for certainty around us. Help us to see your truth and your word for our hearts this morning. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. And so as we think about searching for certainty this morning, you know, there are defining moments in your life, some good, some bad, but very memorable. I'll always remember in the third grade when my teacher, Mrs. Peterson, came in and told us that President Kennedy had been shot in Dallas and killed. I remember where I was sitting. I remember how I felt. Uh, and, and, and even the kind of, sh not just the shock, but the fearfulness I felt inside. And, and in other times of national tragedy, I'm sure you felt those moments, but, but not just those kind of things, but personal moments like on a Tuesday morning when my brother in San Antonio called me and I was joyful and I said, hi, good to hear from you. And his first words are, mom's gone. And I always remember where I was and what happened. And so those kinds of questions about what's going to happen next and those kinds of feelings that we have uh, uh, as we look around the world we live in today, as we're enveloped in this time that we're living through, we certainly have questions of what can we count on? What is certain? I mean, first of all, we went through a pand pandemic, a, a, an experience, we're still going through it in some ways, an experience that none of us have ever gone through before. 
that has shut down parts of our economy, causes fear uh, in our hearts, and, and, and maybe not as much as it did at the beginning, hopefully, but about catching some sort of an invisible illness that we don't completely understand. And then further upheaval and unrest in our culture and in our courtrooms. Lines being drawn all around us, dividing us from one another. Ultimatums being made that require choices. Families and friendships being torn apart. And the bottom line is, our country does not look anything like it did just two years ago. What happened? You know, in our prior life, we might have complained about life being routine, about things being in a rut. You know, but at least with ruts, everything seems the same, always. <laughs> life has a sort of dependable quality to it. The sun comes up in the east every day. The coffee pot goes off at the regular time in the morning and is ready for you to pour it when you want it. It's the same, always. Certainty. But is that reality? Well, the last two years have told us that's not. Someone has stated, life's one certainty is its sheer uncertainty. <laughs> Scripture reminds us in the book of James chapter 4 that we do not know what will happen tomorrow. I doubt if many of you know the name, a man named Larry Silverstein. He was a developer in New York. And he can bear witness to the statement of the only thing that's certain is uncertainty. Because although he owned a lot of impressive property in New York City, he was, according to his own testimony, obsessed by the desire to add the twin towers of the World Trade Center to his holding. And his wish came true six weeks before those two towers came crumbling down. He had signed a 99-year lease worth $3.2 billion for those two buildings. So how do we live in a world full of uncertainty? Well, it almost seems we have two choices. One, constant fear. Or two, a constant state of denial. We live in a society that doesn't know who or what to believe anymore. We keep searching for something certain, but we don't find any real answers in the 70s and the 80s. We tried materialism, gathering money and possessions to make us feel secure. I don't think that's completely out of vogue. I think people still do that. You know what materialism is, don't you? Materialism is spending money we don't have to buy things we don't need in order to impress people we don't like. Okay? <laughs> and so often we get into that. So we tried that, but it left us completely unsatisfied. In the past 30 to 40 years, and actually this philosophy goes back even further than that, but our culture has been transitioning into an extremely dangerous feeling, a, a, a dangerous philosophy of life. It's called nihilism. And here's the definition. Entire rejection of established beliefs as in religion, morals, governments, and law. In philosophy, it is the denial of all existence, rejection of an objective reality or the possibility of an objective basis for morality. No absolutes and no possibilities, nothingness, non-existence. But that a, doesn't that just brighten your day, okay? <laughs> but listen to this last definition in the dictionary. The use of violent methods against a government. Terrorism. What kind of culture do we live in? I mean, we've, like I said, we've been on this road for several years now. When I was growing up, the Rolling Stones had a song, Let's Spend the Night Together. You know, drugs and sex were what most of the rebellious songs were about. Well, we've gone way beyond that now. In 1984, a video game called Duck Hunt came out. I, I remember that. My boys had it. Basically, shooting at cartoon ducks. That's 84. By 1997, 13 years later, a game called Grand Theft Auto came out, 
where you became the bad guy and went around shooting police officers and innocent bystanders. Music, which previously had been about teenage rebellion through songs about drugs and sex, like I mentioned, now took on a much darker tone. A group named Rancid had a song called Let's Go Nihilism. They even used the term, some of the lyrics. Release me from moral assumption, total rejection, total destruction. Another group named Snog had a song with lyrics, let's see some storms, I'd like to see some rain, or better still, let's burn it all down again. And even we as Christians, we live in this culture, we're affected by this culture, and as Christians, many times, if we don't watch it, we have two reactions to it. First of all, is legalism. More rules. If we just had more rules, if we could make an attempt to create more structure, we could deal with the chaos if we just had enough rules. And number two, laxity. No rules. Just go with the flow and adapt the best way you can. But the Bible has a different idea. And in these unstable times, and in this very uncertain world, Peter says there are three things to which we can look to for certainty in the Scripture passage that was read for us. The first one is this, the certainty of a legacy. A legacy is what you leave behind when you die. And let me tell you, it is certain that all of us will leave behind a legacy. What is not certain is what kind of legacy we will leave. And in this passage, Peter very honestly talks about his impending death. And he keeps imploring the writers to remember what he's taught them. He says, when I'm gone, when I've departed, you will remember. And he is holding them accountable for the good news that he has proclaimed to them. I want to ask you something. Think about your own life. Do you remember the people who have poured into your life? Do you remember what they said to you? Maybe some words of wisdom you've never forgotten. Maybe an expression of love so deep and so personal that it changed you. Do you remember how they lived their lives before you? Not perfect, but honest and open, vulnerable and authentic and giving. And that made a deep impression on you that you've never forgotten. I've told you about my mom before and her prayer book, how she prayed for us every single day. And it was her birthday yesterday. She would have been 96 if she was still with us. My brothers and my sister and I all texted about that. And what a special person she was. She left such an incredible legacy. So I want to tell you, whether you want to or not, whether you think about it or not, you will leave a legacy to those you leave behind. So what kind of legacy will it be? There's there's a wonderful song with a great message by Martina McBride called Anyway. Here's the lyrics. You can spend your whole life building something from nothing. One storm can come and blow it all away. Build it anyway. You can chase a dream that seems so out of reach and you know it might not ever come your way. Dream it anyway. God is great, but sometimes life ain't good. And when I pray, it doesn't always turn out like I think it should, but I do it anyway. I do it anyway. This world's gone crazy. It's hard to believe that tomorrow will be better than today. Believe it anyway. You can love someone with all your heart for all the right reasons. In a moment, they can choose to walk away. Love them anyway. You can pour your soul out singing a song you believe in that tomorrow they'll forget you ever sang. Sing it anyway. Yeah, sing it anyway. I sing, I dream, I love. Anyway. Great words. Certainty of a legacy. The next thing. Peter tells us, is the certainty of a testimony. You know, Peter never wavered in his testimony of who Jesus was and what he had done for Peter. His relationship with Christ was sure and sound. And he says in this passage, 
that the stories about Jesus were not devised myths. Peter says, I'm an eyewitness. I saw the power. I heard those things with my ears. And my life has been forever changed. You know, there's nothing more thrilling than a testimony of the power and the grace of God. A lady most of you probably never heard of, Gertrude Mahana, was a famous nightclub singer back, I think, probably in the 40s and 50s even. And she was heavily addicted to alcohol and drugs. And one night, alone in her hotel room, nobody else being there, she cried out to God in the midst of her pain, and she had a miraculous conversion experience. And her agent, who was in the same hotel, she called him on the phone, on the phone. she said, Get me a Bible. And his response was, my God, what's happened to you? And she said, my God has happened to me. And she had a dramatic conversion experience. You know, we've been there. Well, maybe not that dramatic. But we felt that way. And if we're really honest, maybe in the intervening weeks, months, and years, our excitement has waned. Our enthusiasm has faltered. Perhaps fears or unconfessed sins or distractions have crowded out the reality of God in our lives. Maybe we've allowed this culture that's saturated with nihilism to infect us instead of us invading and affecting our culture. So what, what do we do? Is there any hope? Yes. Just look at Peter, the writer of our scripture passage. You remember the story of Peter walking on the water out to Jesus on the lake? I think I've used this in a communion meditation before, but notice this. Did you ever, or did it ever occur to you that Peter walked on the water twice that day? He had the faith. He stepped out of the boat. And then he lost his focus. He began to sink. He cried out to Jesus, Lord, save me. And Jesus reached out his hand and lifted him up and led him back to the boat. He walked on water a second time. No matter how you faltered, no matter how you failed, no matter if you've lost your first love, With Jesus, you can walk on the water again too. He can bring calm. He can bring peace. He can bring stability. He can bring restoration. He can give you a new hope. We're talking about hope today. He can give you a new hope and a new testimony to share. The last thing Peter talks about certainty is the certainty of the word. And Peter tells us three things very quickly about the Word of God here. He begins by telling us that, first of all, the Word of God is sure. He says, and we have something more sure, the prophetic Word. I mean, are you looking for something certain? Are you looking for something sure? Because the people and relationships you know, the the feelings you have, the circumstances you encounter in your life, all of those will fluctuate and change constantly. But the Word of God, Peter says, is sure. It's certain. The psalmist described it this way. We've read through this psalm this week. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. It's sure. And also he tells us about the Word, that it's shining. He said this, And we have something more sure, the prophetic Word, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. God's Word is like a lamp shining in a dark 
place. That's what the psalmist said in 119 again. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And the word for dark here literally means murky. This world is murky. It began as a garden. And now it's turned into a murky swamp. And if we're going to avoid becoming mired in that darkness, then we need the certainty of God's Word to shine into that darkness. If we give in to despair and hopelessness sometimes, it means we're not letting God's Word shine on our situation. If you feel hopeless, if you feel in despair, go to God's Word. Ask Him to give you hope. That's what the Scripture we read as a call to worship this morning said. It said, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. So God's Word is sure. It's shining. And one last thing. It's Spirit-breathed. Scripture said, Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. The certainty of God's Word, it originated in His heart, it originated in His mind. The book of 2 Timothy states the truth this way, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If you and I as Christians, if we feel incomplete, if we feel ill-equipped, if we feel like we are not ready or prepared to face the challenges of life, then it may indicate a need to spend more time in God's Word. You know, what we've been or many of us have been participating in, in doing together this year. Reading through God's Word. So in this constantly changing nihilistic culture we live in, let me ask you, do you have a certain legacy? Other people have poured into your life. What are you pouring into the lives of those around you? Do you have a certain and sure testimony? Do you have a personal relationship with the Lord? Not just a time you can remember when you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, but a personal, ongoing relationship with Jesus. And are you trusting and finding your hope in the certain, sound, sure Word of God? Everything else is constantly changing. Everything else will pass away. But not God's Word. The book of Isaiah says, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the Word of our God endures forever. In the middle of World War II, a woman named Ruth K. Jones, a housewife in England, was undergoing the siege of a madman from Germany named Adolf Hitler who was bombing London every night on a constant basis. And she was having to hide with her children in basements. You can imagine the fear, the terror. Based on that, she wrote a poem, a song. It goes like this. In times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, He's the one. 
This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Let's pray. Father, we face uncertain times, but one thing that is not uncertain is that we can count and depend on you. When everything else around us is changing, constantly changing, you are the unchangeable one. You're the one who has demonstrated your love for us time and time and time again, but most completely and most certainly by the gift of your son. That's what we're celebrating during this Advent season. The gift of Jesus, your son. Who Paul said that you, Father, demonstrated your love for us, showed your love for us, completely in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us we're certain of that and when everything else in this world gives way we find out that is enough in Jesus name Amen